Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Petronas Podcast. My name is Trisha Curtis. I'm the CEO of Petronas and the host of the Petronas Podcast. This is episode 102 of the Petronas Podcast. I am delighted for this podcast. Um, so if you listen to last week, uh, this is last week is everything on the Fed. It's on oil prices. It is on the Biden administration's pause on LNG export permits. Um, and it's a really, really complete deep dive on everything you need to know. Previous one to that episode 100 is an incredible showstopper. It is the panel discussion we had at the Denver Earth Resources Library with Andrew Haney of Nickel Road, Chris Atherton with Energy Net and Daniel Siever with Fundair. So today um, we are, this is the presentation, the keynote address that I gave to the Rocky Mountain GPA conference. This was done in November of 2023. It is exceptionally timely. And the reason I say that is because this was a keynote address. So this was a really deep dive conversation. Um, the audience was absolutely fantastic. The reviews were really, really stellar and just a really great audience, um, really great nerdy questions. So this presentation I taught and this talk and this podcast is called Navigating Risk um, in a Game of Geopolitical, Navigating Risk in a Game of Geopolitical Chess. Um, I think, and as I've said in previous podcasts, I think we are in an unprecedented time of geopolitical volatility, and it's very, very hard for a lot of folks to navigate these markets. Um, and this is why this keynote address is so timely, and I think why it was so well received. But the major themes I talk about within this and the major takeaways are oil prices, um, the Biden and Xi meeting. So a lot of talk about China within this within this keynote address, um, geopolitics and war, the fact that we have um, multiple hotspots around the world. We have the ongoing war in Ukraine and we have what's, you know, the, the new war within within Gaza and the Middle East that was going on um, within between uh, Israel and Hamas that would had been only a basically a month and a half going on at the time I gave this presentation. Um, the forced energy transition in China and a lot on China and the energy transition um, talked about the economy, the U.S. economy, the global economy, and then concluding with talking about U.S. shale. So this is a completely roundhouse, completely conclusive presentation. I think you guys are going to love it. I really look forward to hearing your views, and I'll talk to you soon, folks. Bye. Uh, she is raised in Northwest Colorado in Southwest Wyoming and grew up around pump jacks and has worked on oil and gas sites in Colorado, Colorado with her father. Please join me in welcoming Trisha Curtis. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, it is an absolute pleasure to be with you guys today. Super honored to be your keynote speaker. Um, and unfortunately for you, you're eating, so you're probably going to get distracted because um, they ask me to do these slides. Like, you know, when, I, when people ask me to speak and I say, okay, do we want to do like fireside chat? And they're like, no, no, we want all the slides. Um, so we have all the slides. Um, and unfortunately or fortunately for you, um, it's not like we have very much to talk about today because nothing is happening in the world as we speak of. Um, so we're, we're calling this navigating risk in a game of geopolitical chess. Um, and Truthfully, I, I wouldn't say my job gets harder, but it certainly doesn't get easier. And since 2016 and well before, I mean, I've been covering oil and gas it, basically since my first day of my undergraduate career in, in 2004 and following oil and gas closely. And I can tell you, it's never been, uh, it's never been quite this volatile. So I really do encourage you, if you haven't listened to the Petroners podcast, please do. Um, the, the feedback has been really, really good. It's so funny when I turn these into a podcast, people are like, oh, great content, but you really got to slow down. And they're not in the audience seeing the slides, so it doesn't make quite as much sense. Um, so we do have a lot of slides, mainly for talking points. And these are the, these are the big takeaways I want to talk about. Um, I want to talk about oil prices and what's going on. What, what are oil prices telling us? I want to touch on the Biden G meeting and everything that's going on between China and the U.S. because there's a lot going on with China and the U.S. China really, really matters from the context of the so-called energy transition as well as the health of the Chinese economy, which is certainly something we're seeing in oil prices today with a lot, a lot of concerns around the Chinese economy. Um, geopolitics and war, um, it's really complicated and we're going to get into that, but it's, you know, when we think about US, when we think about Russia, when we think about China, when we think about Iran and Israel, they're all tied in together and it's all extremely complex and convoluted. And we're gonna to try to break that out a little bit today. 
And then we're going to talk about really the forced energy transition to a degree, um, IEA's net zero and China, because we can't leave that out. And we're going to touch on the economy, and we're going to end on a very, very positive note, which has to do with your business, which is U.S. shale, and the 13 million barrels a day of production that the U.S. is producing at record all-time highs of production with less rigs, with longer laterals, and really the industry just doing more with less, which is an incredibly impressive feat. So with that, we're going to dive in. Now, uh, oil prices have actually ticked down a smidgen since I put this slide in here this morning. Um, I'm putting two comments here from the International Energy Agency. One is from the previous month, one is from the most recent month, and both echo a couple different themes. And that's that you know, exports out of Russia have been extremely resilient for, for basically two years. Since the ongoing war in Ukraine, Russia has really not dropped their exports, so we have a lot of Russian crude on the market. We're producing 13 million barrels per day. The Saudis have reiterated their cut of, of another million barrels a day. So the Saudis have continually produced 9 million barrels a day since July. And yet, we have oil prices at 73 and change today. Um, and that, that should make people a little bit nervous and a little bit cautious because the swings that we're seeing in oil prices are really serious. And the reason I point this out from the IEA is because they commented last month about deterioration in U.S. gasoline demand. And you know, I, I look at that gasoline demand over and over and over. It really just hasn't recovered from, you know, we had this nice spike in 2021 when um, at things were ramping up, and it really has not recovered since then from sort of to pre-COVID levels. And you'll see that in the vehicle miles traveled when we get into that. But the real underlying story here is that the IEA, the International Energy Agency, as well as OPEC and a lot of other bulls out there have been saying the demand story for for the second half of this year and why oil prices are going to be so great in the second half, which by the way, we're in that second half and they're not great, is China. And they've been saying that even now, as of the report of two days ago, that China's demand has been 17 million barrels a day. And you know, I didn't buy it then and I don't buy it now. You cannot have a China that's deteriorating in the economic way that they have and you cannot have oil prices at $73 a barrel if China is demanding 17 million barrels a day, which means they have grown 2 million barrels a day in the course of a year from their, their zero COVID lock-ins. I just don't see it. Um, and I think the fundamentals are really showing us that. Uh, we're also seeing very thin trading volumes on WTI. Um, and you know, you're seeing Brent now under 80 bucks. That's a really big deal. That means that the Saudi oil price cut is not, I mean, their Saudi oil production cut really isn't working. Um, and this does get to a problem for the Saudis because they really do want to sort of be around this 80 range, but they've stuck to this cut. The Russians have not. The Russians basically have not complied with any cuts and they've been continuing to put this crude on the market. And really that Russian crude, uh, that, that, uh, narrowing between the Brent and the price of Russian crude. That narrowing has really, really helped Russia. It's helped them support this war in Ukraine, and it's really kept their, pretty, their economy pretty resilient. I'm not saying Russia's doing amazing, but they're certainly not, they, they certainly don't look like a war-torn economy that I think a lot of U.S. politicians and a lot of foreign politicians um, envisioned. So, you know, when OPEC puts this out, like three days ago in their report and they say the oil market fundamentals remain strong and that's their feature article and it's on the front page of their report it's telling you something it's telling you the oil markets the the fundamentals probably are not strong and they're nervous about that so they have to tell you that so um the fact that they have to go through this again they reiterate the chinese demand thing you know the chinese demand thing is a problem because the every time we see oil prices tick down i mean this morning it's for two big reasons it's it's chinese demand data or it's chinese economic data which housing prices took another dive this past month and it's walmart earnings and i took i listened to walmart earnings before i got here and it was it was not good for the health of the U.S. consumer. And what they noted was that uh, October, that just in the span of October, they saw a material tick down in shopping. And that's really, they're telling you that the consumers had it. And the consumers had it in terms of lasting and long-term inflation, high energy prices, and high interest rates. And together, they are really impacting not just the lower end consumer. I was at an investor conference last week in Dallas, and I was kind of disgusted with every single speaker. They were all the talking heads that you see on CNBC. Robert Kaplan was one of them. And they get up there at this investor conference, and they say that basically inflation is a problem for people making $50,000 or less. And I completely disagreed because I'm a small business owner and I can tell you inflation has been a big problem for me, has been probably a big problem for a lot of you guys in the room. And if you run a business, it's certainly been a problem. It's certainly been a problem in the oil and gas industry, but it's really having a material impact. And so when Walmart is ticking down, it's really telling you something. Um, and that's why we have to be very cautious about what oil prices are telling us right now. Um, 
So Saudi Arabia, I mean, I just mentioned this, that, that oil price or the oil production cut, they've been hanging at that 9 million barrel day mark, but you know, they've reiterated that cut and it didn't help push oil prices higher. Um, it really, it didn't even necessarily put a floor on prices. And we're seeing Iranian production go up. And Iranian production is really important because we're gonna get into the geopolitical complexities and we're gonna talk about the atrocities that happened in Gaza, or atrocity, atrocities that happened in Gaza in Israel on October 7th in just a moment. But this Iranian production growth is really meaningful because the US has said, we've had sanctions on Iran, we have not enforced those. And Iran and China have known this for the course of the Biden administration, they've known that that Biden has wanted to be lenient on Iran, and they realized that that they everybody, both Iran and both China knew this. So they've exported a lot of crude oil to China. That's really benefited China as basically being the only importer of Iranian crude. And it's really benefited Iran in terms of a lot of money that they're getting each month. And so when they rise those exports, they rise that production, they're getting a lot of money. And that means they can fund things like Hamas and Hezbollah and create all kinds of problems and wars. Um, so this is that Chinese demand I was talking about. This is the, that, that orange line is their Chinese demand um, annualized through 2022. And you can see in 2022, it took a bit of a dr drop because they had complete zero COVID shutdowns and locked everyone in like Shanghai in their homes for three months and nobody was driving. So it's, yes, people are driving now, but that growth that we're seeing, you see on the right, you see that growth in Chinese demand and that look at 17 million barrels a day, just doesn't seem realistic to me um, because you, one, you probably didn't have, uh, I mean, you had the zero COVID lockdowns, but then you, you ripped open. So everybody's driving, that helps a little bit. Um, but the economy, we're not seeing consumer spending and we're certainly not seeing that rip in the economy. And we know that the property sector is just cratering and that's 30% of their economy. So an economy that size, when 30% of it is in the doldrums, that drives a massive amount of demand, especially in diesel. And I just don't buy the 17 million barrels a day. I think that they've been stockpiling a lot during the course of this year. And then, you know, crack spreads and the margins that refineries get, that tells you a lot about crude oil prices. Sometimes they have to catch up to prices, sometimes prices prices have to catch up to them. And so when you look at diesel cracks and you look at gasoline cracks, you know, China has, when they started pushing, um, started refining a lot of product and then putting it on the market, this happened to have an impact as well. But if China's refining a lot of product and then putting it on the market or the global market, it means that they're not consuming it, which again is telling you about the, cons the consumption side, which is a problem. And oil prices are catching up to all that, all that side on the refining side. Um, I will note, and you know, Bloomberg does not put this out anymore in their data, or at least I don't have access to it, it's those traded volumes of WTI. And they're very important to watch because you can see that in previous years, we had a lot more crude traded. Now, you can, there's, a, there's a couple stories to this that you could say are both bullish and both bearish. And that's that OPEC is saying that traded volumes are driving oil prices lower and that it's just the traded volumes and that the fundamentals remain strong. But the reality is, is if we're not trading that much crude oil, yes, we're exacerbating that price moves, but it means that maybe fundamentals are actually telling us a lot more than those traded volumes. Now, nat gas is a really big story. It's a big story for your business. It's a big story for the midstream side. And it has a huge impact and potential implications for the global economy in the course of 2024, over the course of this winter. And you know, it's not gonna be good for Europe if gas prices go up. It is gonna be good for US shale if gas prices go up. And if we look at 2022 and what gas prices were, average of 650 in MCF, that was the first time we had a massive rise in a sustained rise in gas prices since the shale revolution began. And it had a meaningful and materialful, meaningful impact, material impact on U.S. shale production, not just for gas, but for oil. It really helped the margins for oil, for oil producers. And it, you know, it's the drive that pulls oil up out of the ground. And it's amazing because you see the ability for, for operators to go after deeper, more thermally mature. They can be more aggressive and you can see private operators really go to town. So if we start seeing gas prices go into that 350 range, I think you're going to see a lot of that. It may, it may incentivize some M&A on the gas side, may, maybe, maybe not. If we continually see this, these oil prices compressed the way they are, I don't think we're going to see the same wave that we might have seen on the M&A side. Um, and that this, but Dutch TTF price is at 15 bucks. They've been sort of hanging about 15 to 17 bucks. That's a lot. And it's really important to think about the, the long and hard, I mean, We've had inflation, but Europe has had much higher energy prices, much higher inflation, and this is coming home to roost. 
Germany is extremely exposed as an industrialized economy that has taken down their energy consumption because their energy prices are high, and um, they produce things. And so when energy prices are high, it, it costs them more to produce things. And when they slow that down, um, they're materially impacted by, seriously impacted by their exports to China and their imports from China. So they're already feeling this. So we have to watch Europe closely. High gas prices are going to be bad for Europe. I think Europe's already in recession, but watch them closely because they, while they don't, they've been declining their oil demand for years. Um, if they decline it even by a few hundred thousand barrels a day, that has a meaningful impact to oil demand. It's probably why we're seeing oil prices as soft as they are now as well. Um, we also saw some sabotage to this Finnish gas pipeline, this from Finland to Estonia, that helped drive, has been a component in addition to the war in Israel that has helped drive European natural gas prices higher. Um, this meeting that, that Biden and Xi have, have had, um, just they just had it yesterday, it was really interesting. And I know I have to go off script and it's gonna make me go off, um, it's gonna make me go long, but so these slides, I'm basically just showing you that China is really touting this. It's uh, the fact that they're touting this, and they're, this is all Chinese media. This is all their own sources, and how much they're promoting this meeting of, of, by, of Xi going to San Francisco, of Xi meeting with Biden, and they're saying that, you know, oh my gosh, the speech that, that Xi gave last night was absolutely insane. They're never going to attack anyone. They're super peaceful. You know, the stuff they say over and over, obviously it's not true. Um, but so Biden and Xi met. We saw that yesterday. And then Biden gave a, he gave commentary last night and Biden doesn't often answer a lot of questions so when he does reporters just go nuts and Biden tends to go off script and I'm sure the people who are sort of handling him freaked out because last night he just goes completely off script and he's talking about Israel and Hamas and he's very much defending Israel which I thought was was actually pretty impressive but when he goes off script they ask him about Xi being a dictator because he had mentioned that Xi was a dictator before this whole thing is about Biden and Xi patching everything up and it's all going to be great and we're repairing relations and, and Biden's like, yes, he is a dictator, you know, because, you know, he runs this country and he's a dictator. And it was just hilarious because the news just was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe he said this. Um, so sometimes I just love it when he goes off script. Um, so U.S.-China Security Review, all for all this pomp and circumstance for this meeting, it's all for naught. The Congress just came out with an amazing report. I'm only about 35 pages into it. It's several hundred pages long. It's extremely damning in terms of the security implications with China. It's really, really good. And basically it's telling you that Congress, despite the White House getting all dovish on China, the problems with China remain. They have not changed anything in terms of their human rights record, in terms of their abuses of Uyghurs in the province of Xinjiang, which is particularly important when we're talking about electric vehicles and solar panels and wind turbines, which they all produce with forced labor and fired power generation but it beyond that it's what they're doing in the South China Sea it's what they're doing from a tech standpoint um, it's what they're doing from a propaganda standpoint um, so we just put that in the back of your mind now the atrocities, com atrocities committed in Israel I really don't want to downplay this I actually had um, I had actually an attendee in the audience that I was at last week who actually who he was Jewish and he thanked me for talking about this and I was a bit speechless and I realized I should have, uh, you know, it's the least that I can do because it's the truth. Um, and there are not enough people speaking out about this and explaining how bad it is. And it's, it is important. I mean, Biden did actually mention this last night. It is important to talk about what happened on October 7th because 1,400 Israeli people were, or Jewish people were killed. But it's the way in which they were killed and it's the way Hamas invoked the attack. They did it to get a certain response. And that's really important to think about because I told you that Iran's producing over 3 million barrels a day of crude oil. We've got 20 million barrels a day that goes to the Strait of Hormuz there. And um, since this attack has happened, we've had over 40 attacks on our military throughout Iran or throughout Iraq, throughout Syria. And we've only responded to a few of them um, because, of, because of this attack. But what happened on October 7th was, you know, Hamas came in to the Gaza Strip. They, they came through the Gaza Strip. They came into Israel. And the way they attacked these people was stomping on the necks of babies to kill them, beheading babies, beheading women. And this is how they killed them. And of course, the response that they got was pretty angry. And the response is by the Israelis is to come out and say, we have to get rid of Hamas. And it's important to put this in context that, you know, the leadership of Iran Iran, their goal is to get rid of Israel, to annihilate Israel, to have it not exist. Um, so it makes sense that the response from the Israeli people, or at least that this is how they have to respond. That's what Iran wanted. That's what Hamas wanted is that response, because now they have the whole world very, very mad at Israel. And right before this war happened, or right before this, this war happened on October 7th, 
Oil prices, if you've noticed, came down pretty heartily. And on, so from September 27th, we were at $94 a barrel WTI. And now we're at 73. And yet we have two wars going on. So clearly there's something going on in the market, both from a fundamental standpoint and from probably the geopolitical risk not being baked in, um, in that we could take some Iranian barrels off the market. But the reality is that Saudi Arabia was about to broker a deal with the US. We were going to give them nuclear power. In return, they were maybe going to throw a million barrels a day back on the market and help the Biden administration out. And um, they were also going, so they were going to be friendly with Israel. That was going to be an extension of the Abraham Accords that Trump had done um, at, during that administration. And then we were, they were going to get nuclear power. So it was all going to sort of work out for everyone. And of course, that got completely killed with this attack. Um, nothing that was, I mean, obviously this was planned well in advance, but the, uh, the strength of it and probably how they executed it might have been ramped up a little bit. So Iran produces over 3 million barrels per day. All of their exports, so they only consume, oh, they consume less than 2 million barrels a day, and all of their exports go to China exclusively. So just a simple calculation. If you want to know how, you know, China's funding so much of what's going on in the world, because they're funding Russia and they're funding Iran, at 2 million barrels a day, $80 a barrel, that's um, $160 million a day or $4.8 billion a month. So Iran has not had an incentive to work with the U.S. on lifting sanctions because they're already getting the money from China. China has been very clear in their, pro uh, their pro-Palestinian stance. Um, I feel bad for Israel in this because I think you know, they shouldn't have been duped because they should have known better on China. Um, but the problem is, is that you know, this, China has been very clear, actually politically, they've always been pro-Palestine. Politically, they're just, that's, that's how they work, and they're pro-Iran. So they're not going to go out for, for Israel in this matter. Um, this war in Ukraine, in addition to this war now in the Middle East, has been two years on. And so I think it's really, it's important to realize that yes, the map has changed and what it looks like two years on to this war, but war fatigue is a real thing. We are having problems in the US getting financial assistance to Ukraine, and we are the single largest funder of this war. Um, and so the implications for this are big because you know, now that we have two wars that we're gonna have to be funding in the world, we also have a trillion dollars of interest payments alone on our debt. And that is more than our military spending. So you can see how things get really complex really quickly. And that's partly why folks are looking to downgrade our debt is because we have so many obligations around the world. Um, that's European natural gas production and consumption. Their consumption actually came down a smidgen. Their production only went up a smidgen during the war in Ukraine. That consumption that they pulled down, it's really not positive for their economy that they dropped a consumption of natural gas last year. That's, that's the pains that we're seeing in Germany. That's the repercussions we're seeing in their economy. Um, as I mentioned, Russian production just keeps, OPEC keeps revising these Russian production figures up. You know, they keep saying they're gonna drop, they don't drop. They've basically been hanging at nearly 11 million barrels per day and they're exporting, they've just moved around their exports around the globe. And again, that discount has really narrowed. So to, to put this in recap, I put this in, in a couple different ways for you to look at this. So we got Russia here, we have China. Russia's funding this war, you know, doing this war in Ukraine. Um, so you have this hot war in Ukraine. You have a hot war now in the Middle East. You have this in Israel. You have Iran exporting this war, you know, funding this war, doing this war in Israel. Um, you have Iran also making, wreaking havoc in Yemen. Um, you have Iran giving uh, Hezbollah and giving Hamas lots of money. Um, you have them also giving the Houthis money and doing this war. You've got China giving Russia lots of money. Um, you've got China giving Russia weapons and drones and ammunition, absolutely ammunition, and technology and autos so they can keep this war going on. You've got Russia giving China oil, gas, coal, and grain, all at a massive discount. And you've got um, China getting lots of oil from Iran. You've got, obviously, money from China going to Iran, so they're helping to fund all this. You've got weapons and drones going from Iran to Russia, helping them with this war. And you've got these great batteries and, and solar and wind turbines all being produced in China, in the province of Xinjiang, with forced labor. Um, and Europe is conveniently buying those and giving China lots of money. So it just works out well for everyone. There's a lot of sarcasm there, so I hope you heard that. It's actually, it's not good. Oh, and we've got, um, so we've got these tensions and we've got, you know, obviously problems, potential problems within Taiwan. There's an election on January 13th. We've got um, really a lot of skirmishes going on within the Philippines, lots of ships hitting each other, um, all, lots of volatility within the Philippines right now, probably bigger than Taiwan at the moment. Um, Saudi Arabia, we, we talked about a little bit. We haven't even touched on India and their purchase of this oil. They're kind of staying out of this. And we've got two 
um, aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean telling Iran not to do anything stupid. Um, this nine dash line for China, really important. I just put up this map because I think it's important to put in context of why people are talking about this so much is that China had this nine dash line. They basically said they own everything in the South China Sea. They obviously don't, but they put this map up that they said they had forever. This map is actually on their passports. It's, they do take it really seriously. And then this map to the right, you'll see they actually added a 10th line very recently within the past month. And that 10th line just kind of scoops in Taiwan, just perfect, like just whoop, it's theirs, you know, no big deal. It also encroaches a little bit on India as well as Russia. Um, and so when we think about Taiwan and you think about the Philippines, um, that's just a, a cartoon from Chinese media sources, uh, how seriously they take this. They obviously think it's, it's always us. It, that's always the answer to their problems is we're creating problems. But when you look at that map, Taiwan's right in the middle of the Philippines and Japan. Um, and I'm not saying they're going to attack Taiwan tomorrow. I just think, you know, we probably don't, a lot of folks don't probably appreciate the strategic importance just from a geographic standpoint of where it sits and what it means if they did have Taiwan. Yes, it's a democracy. Yes, it's a, a thriving economy. Economy. Yes, they produce a lot of tech and chips, um, but they're also right there. And if China ever wanted to expand, they would kind of need something to break away in the sea, um, and Taiwan would be it. So the Barbie, Barbie movie, huh? You didn't think I was going to talk about the Barbie movie, did you? Um, but uh, see, it's getting a little more laughs than I did in my last presentation. That's because this map. Um, so the only reason I put this out here is because the Barbie movie put out this map, and all these you had all these Chinese scholars and amateurs basically saying, oh. This is no big deal. Mattel didn't do this on purpose. They weren't doing this to uh, please China. They just had the squiggly line map, and it's a Barbie map. Well, they held up this Barbie map in the movie for a long time. The movie is terrible, so don't go watch it. Um, but this, this squiggly line in the map was there for quite some time, and that squiggly line, it represents that nine-dash line. And the CEO of Mattel was on Bloomberg or CNBC, I can't remember, but I listened to him, and he basically said very clearly, no, we are pacifying, you know, basically the, the Chinese market is much bigger than Vietnam. Vietnam banned the movie because of this, because of this map, because of that nine-dash line encroachment. That's just Hollywood and what you see in our Western media really basically being okay with, with um, contending with China and saying this is all okay, which it's not. Um, so this is an image from the White House. If you go to thewhitehouse.gov, you'll see this. I put this up here because obviously the White House has, has been very, very big. This administration is the single you know, most anti-domestic oil and gas administration that we've ever had in the history of America. Um, and they're very big on wind and solar and greening up the U.S. grid. Um, and that wind and solar is coming from China. And so I put up this, this image because this is the image they have. Those solar panels 100% came from China. There's no way around that. Even if they came from Malaysia or Vietnam, they was, actually came from China and they actually came from forced labor. And I just put this in here because if you zoom in on that piece of paper, there's literally nothing on it. It's just a piece of paper that they're staring at, which um, just kind of solidifies what the administration is doing on energy. Um, their uh, SPR, they've drained a lot of the SPR, so that is a big problem. That's why they've gone to Venezuela. Venezuela is only producing about 800,000 bar barrels per day. They're not going to bail us out. The, the, industry really, or the, the administration really needs to start looking to the industry. And the industry, for all its part, has done a lot because we are producing over 13 million barrels per day, and we have 124 billion cubic feet per day of, of natural gas um, production, which in the context of the global market of, uh, of that's gross withdrawals, but the global market for natural gas is 400 billion cubic feet per day. So the damage that we could do on natural gas is huge and meaningful. Um, so this is net zero, the IEA's net zero. I put this up, you guys have probably heard me talk about this before, but that net zero scenario, so when everybody talks about net zero, and you definitely have, I criticize the, the um, domestic oil and gas industry for talking way too much about net zero, but you know I have to give credit where credit is due, and a lot of them have pulled that rhetoric back. But net zero it, by 2050 is a 25 million barrel day demand drop um, by 2030, which is just, it simply cannot happen. It's impossible. Um, Exxon, actually one of the proxy filings, said as much. They said it was impossible and it wasn't going to happen, so basically they, they couldn't contend with it. Um, that was kind of buried, so we can't give Exxon too much credit because they did bury that in a proxy filing. Um, now, the IEA's natural gas outlook, you, this is, just really tells you how politicized the IEA has become as this advocacy organization. Because natural gas, as I just told you, a 400 billion cubic feet per day market, we know that it is a very high form of energy. It's high BTUs. It works well. You green up your economy pretty quickly. You reduce your pollution. And you can really solve a lot of the world's energy problems with natural gas. So we, you would think that you'd be using a lot of it. But the World Energy Outlook has really taken down their, um, their outlook for their demand uh, for what this looks like, which again is very, very political. That's global oil consumption. We took a dive a little bit in COVID, but it's back off to the races. 
Um, that's global coal consumption in purple. It's way back up. That's, global, that's natural gas consumption and production. Again, that 400 BCF a day. That's going nowhere but up. This is OPEC's outlook, their long-term outlook. Obviously, they're going to be a little bit more bullish, but you can see their revisions in that outlook, and they see it growing significantly. It's probably not going to grow that significantly, but just for context, I put where IEA's net zero is, and you can see it's a massive, massive gap in reality from both of these guys. Now, global power generation by fuel, this is why the net zero thing doesn't really work, is because we just add more energy. So that green chunk is your renewables. That's largely your wind and solar. But in that black chunk is coal-fired power generation. This entire globe, global power generation by fuel. Now, this is telling you that it's just growing. And largely that coal is coming from, from China, and a lot of that gas is coming from the US. And the story of, you know, we have to change the world and we have to get to net zero and we have to lower the temperature is all about CO2 emissions, supposedly. I don't really buy it because we're not doing much on it, but that's global CO2 emissions on the left. That is Chinese CO2 emissions in red, that is us in orange, that's total Europe coming down a little bit and India going up. Now, Chinese versus the US, that's what it looks like. We have nosedive our emissions because we have added a lot of natural gas into our grid and China keeps going up because they have a lot of coal-fired power generation. If we keep these relations up with China and say, awesome, let's do business, you can make our solar panels, you can make our wind turbines, they make them with coal and they increase that, those CO2 emissions up. So it is literally all for naught. You are just playing whack-a-mole with global CO2 emissions. And those, and that, those solar panels and those wind turbines, China does not always make the nicest of products. Sometimes they're crappy and sometimes they have to be replaced. Wind turbines and solar panels, solar panels usually last 10 years, sometimes 12 years, sometimes 15 years. Try getting a warranty on that, you can't get one. And it is, you can hear that Chinese solar panels sometimes last one to two years, which means if you're shoving all these solar panels into the grid from China, your capital refreshment costs could be way, way higher than people are thinking. And that could be extremely damning to economies, especially Europe. So net zero and temp ranges, this is really scary because on the net zero, the only reason I show this is that temp range in green goes from one to over two. And the goal is to go to 1.5. So if you can go over two by killing your economy and murdering your economy with net zero and you still go up, it means that it prob they're not even sure they can do this with murdering the economy. Um, Bloomberg Philanthropies, I put this up because a lot of us get so much of our information from, from Bloomberg. And this is where things get really torn. Bloomberg, you know, I, I read a ton of their stuff. I go through CNBC, I go through BBC, you name it. And Bloomberg still puts the word like alleged in front of spy balloon for the Chinese spy balloon. It was definitely not alleged. It's not, so it's not alleged. It's also, they keep saying it's alleged for human rights abuses. But Bloomberg also supports a massive anti-divestment out of coal and out of natural gas for all of power which is uh, extremely damning for global energy security, but it's meaningful because a lot of money is put into this. And he also puts a lot of money, Bloomberg himself, into campaigns like in Denver, again, in the mayor race, he put a lot of money um, backing the mayor who actually won. So you can see it gets very political very quick. So EU trade with China, and somebody's just gonna have to flag me on time because I know I'm, I'm probably way over. Um, EU trade with China, that's solar panels. That was a nearly a over 100% increase last year alone. So China benefited massively with this war in Ukraine because the European Union just went to China and bought tons and tons of solar panels. That trade with them really grew. That's put them in a pickle because the trade relationship now has really exposed Europe, obviously, to their economy and vice versa. Um, but China controls the entire value chain for rare earth minerals, for processed minerals, from, from graphite to copper to everything. And that's typically because when you process these minerals, it's extremely environmentally intensive. You have to extract very bad things like thorium and uranium off of it. And nobody in the world does it except for China because they don't care about the environmental stuff. And they do that in the province of Xinjiang. I'm quite serious about this in that they have incentivized companies, electric vehicle companies, they have incentivized intensive manufacturing, extractive industries, all to move up to the province of Xinjiang. That is really convenient because no one knows what the hell is happening out there and they have complete surveillance and control over that entire society. And they subsidize all that. So not only is it cheap coal, everything's made from coal-fired power generation because they have a lot of it, but they further subsidize that. And then they subsidize the labor by making it forced. So you can see how they can flood electric vehicles into the European market very, very easily at a very, very cheap price. And that is how they compete. They compete with forced labor. They compete with um, subsidized energy prices. And it's very, very hard for businesses at all to compete with that. It's also just wrong and it's uh, not ESG friendly. 
Um, so that's the problem. Is that that's a, a, a really, really great report. I've told a lot of people about this. Sheffield University does incredible work on the human rights abuses within China, especially within solar, but also within others. And then you can just see, that's actually the International Energy Agency. They show you how cheap it is to make solar panels in the province of Xinjiang. That's because of coal. They don't talk at all about the forced labor and why it's so cheap on the labor side, but they do talk about the cheap coal. Um, China's gas, they barely consume, they consume very little natural gas because they don't have natural gas. So their coal consumption, they're really quite secure in their coal production and consumption. And this is energy security. China cares deeply about energy security. So if we think that Joe Biden or John Kerry are gonna change China's consumption of coal, there is not a prayer chance in hell. This is about energy security for China. It is not changing, which means that CO2 problem is always going to be a problem. That is, U that is uh, US power generation, it's 4,500 terawatt hours. Then a Chinese power generation, it is 9,000 terawatt hours. That's their coal, that's our gas. You can see the massive difference. They added over 1,000 terawatt, hour terawatt hours of coal-fired power generation in 2021 alone. We do not even have 1,000 terawatt hours of coal-fired power generation. Okay, the economy, and I'm over, but we're gonna just keep going. Um, We'll go through this fast. Okay, so European economy, the reason we have to pay attention to this for all the reasons I just told you about is because they demand oil and gas. And we, that demand has come down over time, but the exposure, I think, to the German economy, to, to China, is really serious. And I think we, we are really beginning to see those cracks in the oil market already. Now, China's real estate index, that is just the, the real estate and property sector, as I mentioned, has absolutely cratered. You can see this in the index. It is really down. Nobody invests in the Chinese stock market for a store of value like we invest in our stock market. Um, but from a, that's why property mattered so much is because people did invest in property as a store of value. And now that they don't have it, people really are not spending in China. And I can't tell you how many people I talked to, how many people who have been over there recently, the economic troubles are palpable. People are very, very concerned about the economy and they're not spending or they're trading down because of it. Um, that's GDP, that's a house of cards. Those numbers are not really real, but even not being real, they're still trending very down. They're pro Likely they're not even positive in a GDP growth standpoint, um, but that's really meaningful and that is, again, probably why we're seeing oil prices where they're at. Um, you can see that their property sector is cratering. That's Country Garden. That is the largest property developer. This is a chart on the right, just shows you the decline in property prices across cities. This is not just tier one cities like Beijing and Shanghai and Shenzhen. Those are not insulated even. Those, those in Beijing, Shanghai and Shenzhen, property prices have declined. It's not just the tier two cities or the tier three cities. Um, we have massive debt in the US. We have a, a, over, over $17 trillion in debt. I've talked about this before. Every quarter this gets updated, every quarter it goes up. That debt is something that we are, when you're listening to the Walmart earnings call, or, oh, when you're listening to that earnings call, that's what you're hearing. You're hearing the consumer is putting all this stuff on credit cards, they're maxed out, and the credit card interest rates are really high, but they have everything else. They have student loans and they have auto loans, which we have a subprime auto crisis that's sort of looming and it's right there. And we have a commercial real estate crisis that's looming, but that debt is really massive. And the consumer is topped out between all this debt, all their, their savings are gone, um, and inflation just has been too high for too long. And actually, oil prices coming down, everybody's getting excited about that, thinking that's gonna save the consumer. <laughs> oil prices coming down is probably because the consumer is hurting, um, and that's not good. But it's also that if oil prices are to tick up, and given this volatility in the war, the impact of the consumer could be a lot bigger than people think, which means they would slow down. So the sticky things, I put this in before I listened to the Walmart earnings call, because we had inflation come down a little, or basically was flat last, or yesterday, or last two days, month over month, it's flat. But look at, poor, look at, ground beef prices, look at egg prices, look at chicken prices. They are still extremely elevated and they are just killing the consumer if you're trying to eat. If you're trying to feed your family at home just protein, you're having a problem doing that because they're still very elevated and wages are still, ele still significantly elevated. That's inflation in oil prices. This is annualized. This is updated for last year. The, the takeaway from this is that historically speaking, we just haven't had, you had high inflation, but you didn't have very high oil prices. And now we have these kind of sticky high oil prices and we have the sticky inflation. And I think it's just, it's really gone on for too long, too, uh, much too long. Um, this is a telling, you don't have to take anything away from this other than unemployment lags uh, interest rates and it lags inflation and it lags the whole thing that the Fed is doing with raising interest rates or holding interest rates. Yes, unemployment has not come up, but it typically lags about two years. Think of the crisis in 2008. Think of when unemployment peaked in 2010. Happened in the 1980s as well. Um, our interest payments on our federal debt 
are nearing a trillion dollars, as I mentioned, that is more than our military spending. That's just because interest rates are going up, and that's extremely, I mean, that is extremely meaningful and extremely impactful for how we, how we actually finance and pay off our debt, because we have 1.7 trillion deficit right now. Um, fiscal spending, this is really serious. I put these not to, to really scream at them, but there's a lot of debate on fiscal spending. Yes, Republicans spend, yes, Democrats spend, everybody blows out the budget, absolutely. They spend differently, and this administration has spent differently. Entitlement programs like food stamps went up by, they tripled under the Biden administration. And so you went from like 60 billion to 160 billion. Massive, massive growth. And that did contribute hugely to, we led the world in food inflation as a, the developed world. We had food inflation well before anybody else did because we added so much federal spending in food stamps and welfare spending. Massive, massive. We have nearly a trillion dollars in welfare spending. That's really painful for the budget, for the actual balancing your budget. And it also has huge implications to, and it inflates the economy because people, are, people were spending then. And now that sort of, that pricing power, they've lost it. Um, and that's why you're seeing things like the UAW auto strikes. That was about electric vehicles, but it's also about these people just not having enough money because of inflation. Um, 30 year mortgage rates are way too high. The last time we were at these, uh, in terms of, it's basically the, the housing sector is at a complete standstill right now. The last time we had these high of interest rates, we had a much lower, we only had a $200,000 average mortgage and we're more than double that. Um, I just mentioned the UAW auto strikes. That's about ready to get sealed and put a bow on it. Um, but really they were asking for five days of pay at a four day work week. And this was about the energy transition because you do not need as many people to make an electric vehicle as you do an internal combustion engine or ICE vehicle. And they were asking for guaranteed pay, guaranteed jobs forever. Basically when the job is gone, they wanted to be paid for community service. This is unsustainable, it's untenable, um, and it, will, it, it could lead to these companies absolutely being bankrupt. We have seen them bankrupt before. We saw them bankrupt in 2008 and the government had to take them over. Um, that's vehicle miles traveled in black. That's gasoline demand in yellow. It has not recovered from pre-COVID levels, and that is largely from the work from home. Yes, we're driving, but we're driving differently and we're commuting differently. And I would say some of that softness is people pulling back and people just not having the money. Um, U.S. shale, I will go through this really fast. I promise we have time for Q&A. Um, okay. 13 million barrels a day, really driven by incredible record um, Texas production growth. We're at an all-time record high for Texas production growth. But I want to point out how resilient the Rockies are. I mean, North Dakota production has been, yes, it's come down from its pre-COVID levels, but it is extremely resilient, especially in the face of just far less rigs. Um, and we are drilling significantly longer laterals, and we have done a lot more with less. Yes, we have massive inflation in the business. You can talk to me offline or you can ask in Q&A, I think how the service sector and how E&Ps are at. It's really important from a midstream perspective that you guys pay very, very close attention to what the E&Ps are doing. Um, same for the service sector. And one of the biggest risks is that the E&Ps aren't, you know, don't completely understand what's going on with oil prices and they, don't, they, they interpret that differently than say the service providers or the midstream guys. Um, now, if you stack up basically Alaska, California, and Colorado, and yes, I do put Colorado in this because while the rock in Colorado is great, the regulatory piece is huge. Um, for perspective, DJ Wells went from 1,200 in 2019 to wells that were completed and done in the system to um, 628 in 2022. So we're doing just a lot less in Colorado. And when you stack up that production in those states where we basically can't drill and produce nearly as much, it is a fraction, is way less than two counties in New Mexico, which is Lee and Eddie County, which are just absolutely crushing it, producing nearly two million barrels per day, telling you that the rock is amazing. This is some of the best rock in the entire world. Um, the oil and gas industry, we still are not reinvesting at the rate we should. And this is really important because if you look at the Dallas Fed survey, if you look at across anywhere and people talking, we have just not gotten the general investor or the retail investor back in the space. And that is partly, and you guys know this from me, but I am critical of the oil and gas industry leaders not being more vocal and more talking about the oil and gas industry. This is now coming back to their share price performance. Oil and gas industry leaders have to start talking publicly about why people need to buy their stock, why they need to hold their stock. That means they have to explain very clearly why oil and gas is a smart long-term investment. It's not just a smart long-term investment, it's actually giving you incredible returns right now, and yet we're not seeing the reinvestment in the space and we're still seeing people out of it that's because they've likened it to tobacco but it's extremely extremely important from a share price performance it's extremely important from a reinvestment standpoint and it's extremely important for the longevity of this business I, I don't have time for it but I can't underscore how important it is to look at credit access capital access the impacts of ESG the ability to get insurance all these are huge 
Um, to Exxon's credit, they have been talking more and more about ESG pressure and that actually being a direct result in impacting capital spending and the fact that they are basically trying to push through that. I don't like that Darren Woods has had, he now has a big investment in China. I don't think that's good exposure or risk. However, I do like what Darren Woods and Scott Sheffield said on the call when they said we're, we're doing this merger. Um, this is an all stock acquisition as we've seen the other acquisitions. So that tells you that basically this is what the market, the street is allowing you to do is these all stock acquisitions. Um, but it really did make sense. I mean, you know the Pioneer position, it's just, it's a beautiful acreage position. It's extremely well cored up. It's really nice. And um, Exxon did not say it out loud, but eventually they said, we can do more with your acreage than you are. And that's because Pioneer's decline curves have sort of been smashed. And uh, Exxon has been talking a lot about technology and tech and what they can do. And you can see the production. Pioneer was producing 500,000 barrels per day. Exxon, this is oil. Exxon, 350,000 per barrels per day. So they are absolute behemoth now. Um, the rig count, we have done way more with less. We did not go back to our pre-COVID highs. We do not need to, um, as we can see from the 13 million barrels a day. Those are lateral lengths, and in middle and lateral lengths, are looking, you're looking at well north of 11,000 feet on average. We are seeing, continually seeing 3,000 or three mile long laterals, four mile long laterals. This is continuing. You're certainly going to see this in the DJ with the regulatory issues. And we produce a massive amount of gas. I mean, well over 20 BCF a day in the Permian. That gas drive in, in the Delaware is just huge. It's a really, really important to think about that gas drive um, in the Delaware driving that up. If gas prices go higher this year, this will be really positive for the Permian. Um, a change in administration. Sorry, some little tech issue. Apologies. Um, sorry, guys. Okay, we'll do this manually. Okay, change in administration would be very positive um, because we would have to, we would be able to probably build out more pipelines. That's gonna be really needed on the gas side. This is a map that shows you public and private rigs. The orange is public, the purple are private. And the takeaway here is really what the trajectory is of this has been. You can see the issue pressure and the investment pressure, the slowness of ENPs to really get off to the races of the, on the public side when oil prices came back and, and coming back out of COVID, it's been really difficult for them. And then they finally did. But basically we're sort of in line right now but you can see the takeaway is that the public guys are really really cored up and the um the purple guys the private guys are willing to step out and do more on the on the fringes you really see this in ducks the drilled but uncompleted wells we don't have to argue on what a duck is when it was done how old it is the fact that this was a drilled hole in the ground that's what this is just for all intents and purposes and you can see how spread out the purple is of these private operators that is partly because gas prices were so damn high last year but this is also really big because it tells you these private companies they step out and so if you think the day of the private operators is done it's absolutely not because any boom and we're going to have if we have a gas prices go to 350 you're going to see the privates um react to that probably more meaningfully than the public's and then if we look at a simple way to look at this is that's U.S. completions. Those, are, those stacked lines are your total completions. This includes horizontal, includes everything. The orange is the, is the public again. The purple is private. We have not come back to our pre-COVID levels. That green line is WTI. And you have the corresponding grid counts. That's Permian completions. You basically have come back to you know, your pre-COVID levels in the Permian. Permian's driving the growth in America. And you can see, but you can see in U.S. completions when you break out the public and private, the privates have done great. They have nearly come back in, in completely, but the publics have not. And that is your ESG investor pressure. And that is extremely meaningful because it has a huge impact when we're talking about what happens in the Rockies when you were dominated by the publics. Um, that's just the Permian for perspectives. You can see as the privates came down, the publics have come back. And we've seen a lot of, we've actually seen a, a pretty decent amount of resiliency there with publics. Um, Permian publics have nearly come back on the completion side. Privates have just went crazy. It's an incredibly impressive story of what privates have done. And that is despite the fact that private equity, that these guys are making money, have great returns, and private equity funds are half of what they were pre-COVID. Um, if we're looking at Rocky's production, again, it is a resilient story. We're not, the growth is not there, but that resilient production, especially in the Wilson Basin, is really impressive. We're seeing pretty strong activity, actually, in the Uinta. When you look at this rig count from Uinta to DJ to powder, Powder productivity has been a little patchy. Those, well, it's, it's a geologic play. I worked in it. I think a lot of you guys have as well. It's great from a geology perspective. I have a ton of podcasts that I've done as of late, but it's really the stories. Uh, we know the DJ, we know the rock. We have regulatory issues. Um, the Wilson rock is phenomenal. And we're just seeing that, we're actually seeing that in the productivity data of how well it's held up. Um, that's your average lot of lengths in the Rockies. They continue to climb. Um, Rockies completions. 
That's your story for Rockley's completions, and that is really about um, the dominance of, of public companies in the space, and really Colorado on the regulatory side. And that's your public-private split. Again, you can see the publics just have not come back to the Rockies. Um, that's because their exposure to Texas, but that's also um, because Colorado is not, it, it pulls those dollars away if those people have of capital in Texas as well, or New Mexico. And that's your Wilson decline curve. It's, a re, it's actually really strong. Um, it looked great in 2022. It is really held in there. And that's, I think the Wilson is a rock that keeps on giving as most rocks in the US are. And you can actually see that across the board when you take all US shale plays and you put them together and you normalize the lateral length. We are just not seeing massive diminishing marginal returns. We saw a massive uplift for 2022 in gas. That's because people were targeting gas. But the fact that we didn't see diminishing marginal returns when we have longer laterals, when we have lots of private companies, when we have huge step outs in acreage is telling you that this rock has a lot left to give. And with that, I thank you very, very much for your time. All right, thank you. Awesome speech. We've got about uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, first question I have is kind of curious, you know, directly related to the Rockies. Uh, we're all here, most of us are local. But with the you know, massive consolidation with the larger public companies swallowing up most of the smaller companies and having such few operators here left, in particular in the DJ, um, you talked a little bit about, you know, all across the U.S. having consolidation between bigger oil companies but less on the gas side. So I was kind of curious you want to talk a little bit about predictions in the Rockies on more consolidation and any predictions on uh, potential consolidation across the country on the natural gas side like we've seen on the oil side. Yeah, I, good, good, very good question. Um, so I think we will see consolidation on the gas side, especially, I, I mean, suppressed gas prices could help drive that, but also higher gas prices could help drive that. But you have to, you actually have to have consolidation in places like the Haynesville to really help the Haynesville with that trajectory and growth. You have a lot of privates in the Haynesville, but in Appalachia, in the Marcellus, you're going to probably have to have, uh, you're going to have to have consolidation as well because of when gas prices go down, uh, we have big problems and because we don't have a pipeline out of um, the Marcellus. So you're going to see some of those consolidations. You've already started seeing them. You see EQT gobbles up folks here and there. And then you see a lot of consolidation, I think, in terms of look at what Civitas has been doing in, I mean, Civitas was a pure, was extraction, was XOG, was a pure uh, um, Denver DJ based player. And obviously they've stepped meaningfully into, te into the um, the Permian, and then they keep gobbling up little positions here and there, and they're amassing this position. So you're seeing stuff like that. I think, you know, if you were to think about it um, several years ago, when you look at EOG, um, they always talked about organic growth. I do think the organic way to do it is the best. It's simply the cheapest way to do it. Um, it's a, you have acreage and, or you're just buying up acreage. So I think you will start to see, I mean, there's an opportunity for that. I think there's a runway for that. The problem is when prices get lower, so we had, we had the Exxon and Pioneer deal, we had the Hess um, and Chevron deal, and everyone keeps telling me that they don't think Hess, you know, that, that Chevron bought Hess, they just bought it for offshore, or the Guyana, which is fantastic. Guyana is this gift that keeps on giving. I didn't show you Brazilian production, but it's fantastic. I mean, Guyana is awesome. That is great. But the Willison is really awesome too. And I think that if Hess had, uh, you didn't care about the Willison acres, they would have sold that off a long time ago. They didn't. I think a lot of folks would love to buy that. So will Chevron Chevron sell that? I don't know. I, I don't. I wouldn't advise them to. I, I do not think it's smart to sell off the Wilson at all. Um, but Chevron has, you know, buying PDC. We've seen. Um, we're going to see slower activity. Obviously, I, I think consolidation in the DJ is not really good for the DJ. It really, really slows things down because of the regulatory environment and because people really are buying permits. I am bullish on the Rock and the DJ. I just don't think the operators like a Chevron and Oxy. I do think they absolutely need to be way more vocal about the regulatory environment. Um, but they're not. Um, and so consolidation DJ, you may see it if we continue to have pressure and we just have slowing of permits. And then are we going to see the big wave of acquisitions in the, in, in the bulk of the space at $73 oil? And if we can deteriorate in oil, maybe not. And that's because you're, when those deals were done, they were probably already started at much higher oil prices. And the oil prices shifted down and they sort of were OK in that 80 range and the days that they happened. So they took months and months and months to get done. And then they happened at whatever oil prices happened to be. But I don't think a lot of people, it's not just 
M&A and acquisitions in the oil space that people get nervous about. They get nervous about business. When oil prices go down and you get into recessionary territory, um, people just get anxious. And that's not because you shouldn't be. There's probably a lot of deals to be had. And I would advise like looking through the forest of the trees that even with lower oil prices, you can do a lot more with less. If we have less inflation, if we have lower rig count, you know, lower day rates, there's a lot of opportunity to really drill and push through this. Um, but I would say that, yes, it could compress the behavior a little bit. Excellent. Well, uh, we all know we've gotten a lot of information here in the last 45, 50 minutes, uh, starting from some of the geopolitics, black swan events, uh, global perspective, regional perspective, weather gas. I'm sure we've got some more questions. Um, the mic in the middle of the room, we've still got five or 10 minutes. If anybody else has any more questions for Tricia, uh, we certainly have, we can push back the schedule about five or 10 minutes since we got started just a little bit late. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to go ahead and step up. Hi. Um, okay, so the U.S. is at all-time high output production right now. When does that stop, in your opinion? Like, when is this growth going to be capped? At what number if you can throw out an estimate? If, if, if you can do that. Um, I, I don't like to do that because I'm pretty bullish on the rock. Um, and so I think the ability to, a lot of people were skeptical of the ability to get back to 13 million barrels per day. And again, we did do it with a lot less. You saw we did it with less wells. We did it with stepping out of the acreage that people, so people said we couldn't do it with all, we're, we've drilled everything up. The tier one is gone. Obviously the tier two and tier three, um, people have seemed to make them work and that step out, the decline curve is telling us that. So I, I think we can still go higher. Um, we're probably, when you hit 14, 15 million barrels per day, it, it would take a lot of work to get there. I think we technically could. I think secondary recovery, we haven't even talked about, could take us a lot higher. Um, I am a little less concerned about, you know, when people talk about the sticks on the map and we just don't have enough to drill. I, I think we have quite a bit left to drill. Um, I think we have a lot of tinkering to do and prices do matter. So a little bit, you know, if we're staying in 70s, $80 oil prices, but we have a decrease, you know, if we have a recession and we have people wanting to come back to work in this space and we have some deflation on the, that side, that's really positive. There's a lot of play, there's a lot of factors that could happen to really help drive U.S. production growth up, um, lowering inflation in across the board from employees to, to insurance costs to everything would be meaningful. If we continue to see inflationary pressures, if we continue to see this, we're going to get, we're, we could be at a stalled out standpoint. But I don't think when you're looking at that reinvestment and you're looking at the publics, I think this isn't about that they couldn't drill more, it's that they aren't drilling more um, because they've really pulled back. And so you can see that the privates have, and even with the privates stepping out, and longer laterals, we're not seeing the massive diminishing marginal return. So I think we've got up. We, we've got a lot of, we have upside from here. The rock is telling us that it, it can do a lot more. Uh, follow up question, just uh, what resources do you read to get this level of in-depth knowledge? And what would you recommend that I read? Because this is fascinating. Um, you don't sleep. Um, let's start with that. Uh, so it's a lot. Um, I cover a lot of China stuff, so a lot of random, a lot of random China podcasts, um, a lot of Chinese media sources, um, and it's really actually the Asian market. So uh, the world happens when the world happens, but by the time the market is opened at whatever time you guys are turning on TV and having your coffee in the morning, all the news has already happened. So the Middle East market is, you know, is in the evening. The Asian market's in the evening, and that's really when things are moving. So um, that's I follow that, and it, and it's primary sources, and I. To always tell it it's that you find an article whatever it's that primary source so um, that's really the name of the game and so that takes time and diligence and work and it's taken sort of years to figure out what is important and what's not um, fortunately literally that's what I do for a business is help people sift out what they don't need to know and you know hone in on what they do um, and it's a ton of intel and it's really difficult so um, I mean that's literally what it should try to curate it and clean it up but I mean the primary sources I would say is number one um, and uh, the evening market open Is that factored in and do you think that that's going to make a 
big difference in that uh, growth of emissions, or how do you think that that's going to play out? You know, Chinese, any data on China is, um, you have to take it not just with a little salt, but like with a massive, massive grain of salt. Because um, it's, it's just not, it's all fudged. Um, and it, it truly is China's economy and China's data is, is a house of cards. Um, so I don't even know if truly we could probably rely on the emissions data. But when it comes to coal, when it comes to energy, and energy policy in China is extremely convoluted. Like you have all these different provinces, they do not share power, they overbuild, and they overbuild because each province is sort of mandated to hit a certain growth output target, growth target. And a lot of ways they did that was infrastructure growth and let's build up a bunch of coal-fired power generation and you certainly don't want to not have enough power. And they saw that in 2021. You have places in southern China with a lot of hydropower, massive amount of hydropower, but when it doesn't rain, you have a big problem with hydropower. Um, and so that's a big problem. So they ramp up their, their coal-fired power generation and they don't share from provinces. So I think on the efficiency standpoint, they do have a lot of new coal-fired power generation. I mean, when I said they added 1,000 terawatt hours, they're, they're adding new coal-fired power generation. And again, that's because they're making stuff, folks. They're like making products and materials, stuff that we buy, iPhones, stuff that you have to have really good power. You do not make ammunitions, you do not make planes, you do not make solar panels, you don't make jack with wind and solar. It's just not good forms of energy. By the time it gets into these light bulbs, we've lost so much power that we, it, we've lost so much money and we've lost so much power, it's not efficient. So when we think about these coal-fired power generation, the newness of them, yeah, some of them are way more efficient than others. I would be careful though, in terms of just the, uh, you know, you, if they cared about emissions, they would be capturing the emissions on them. They're not gonna do that. Some of them are, I mean, much cleaner, much more efficient. They can make a lot with them. So from that standpoint, they work out well, but they are new. And so they're not gonna decommission these. I mean, these are, they built these, these are in for the long haul. And China overbuilds everything. They, they overbuild, and so they may be building more than they need. And as their economy slows, they may not need that. So really, I mean, we should be, when we see their, if we see their emissions fall, and the fact that we saw their emissions go up, not down, even when their economy ticked down, that, that's telling you a lot. It, it, there's probably some in, lots of inefficiencies within their economy and from their energy production output. But that's it's a really good question. There's kind of a lot more to it, but I'm happy to dive into it a little more with you offline. But great question, thank you. Thank you. All right, we probably got time for uh, one more question. Uh, it's a great question. I think, you know, it starts from the companies. And I, I say that and I say it a lot, but it really does. And that's because, you know, I was just at an investor conference in Dallas last week. Um, and I can't tell you how many people came up to me and were like, wow, this is, you were just really frank. And I thought, holy moly. I mean, I did actually cuss in that, that presentation, but um, by accident. Um, but they were, I, I was really frank. And I think they were kind of shocked by that frankness of this information, that material as, as folks in the investment audience. Um, so the companies themselves have to do it, first and foremost, because I think they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to be talking about this is how we're making money um, and that we produce oil and gas. And they have to actually explain that, again, from just an explanation standpoint of how they do it and why people have to invest in it so they understand it. There's so little intel on the oil and gas space, which is why when I talk about this stuff, I care about it really deeply. This information has to get into the market just for you guys to understand, but also for the wider market so they can help understand how to work with you guys, how to invest in your businesses. So it's information flow. It's getting that out there that's really, really important. And it does start with the company. So when Jamie Dimon talks, says, you know, we have to invest in oil and gas, that's really great because it starts getting people within his, you know, within his aura and people in his company to say, okay, how do, how do we think about that? We have to invest in this. And so you have to have, you have to be talking about it more. You have to get folks like that on TV. You know, when Chris Wright gets on CNBC, that's really great. But you know, when, and when Toby Rice gets on CNBC, that's great. But increasingly, even when these guys are getting on CNBC and Bloomberg, their push, the pushback on with the energy transition is massive. And so the industry has to do a significant greater job at talking about the business, even just, just sheer talking about the business, how we do the business, what we do, and and, and how it's making money because the anti the sort of it, it's tobacco and it's terrible that's one thing but the reinvestment rate is it's meaningful because you're making we had very high oil prices and the fact that those public companies were not putting the drill bit back in the ground when they should have been they're going to regret that later because they could have had really amazing returns in the past few years and they did not take that opportunity because they were too damn scared of their shareholders Thank you very much. absolutely
All right, well, uh, please give me, join me in giving a big round of applause for Tricia. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you, guys.